Good afternoon and welcome to our midweek Bible study here at Red Mountain Baptist Church. I want to thank you for joining us. I know it's been a couple of weeks with us having missions night and I took a couple days off when the kids had spring break, but it's good to be back with you and uh, coming to you and sharing God's Word with you out of the book of Hosea. If you remember a few weeks ago, we started a series going to the book of Hosea and we're in chapter 2 uh, today, uh, finishing up chapter 2 and carrying on into chapter 3. So if you want to go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to Hosea chapter 2, that's where we're going to be uh, today as we dive into God's Word together. Um, I do want to thank you for praying for Wanda Howerton. As you know, she's in the hospital. Uh, we missed her being with us on Sunday. She missed being here on Sunday. And uh, she was extremely dehydrated and uh, had some other issues going on. She does have a uh, kidney infection in both her kidneys, but she is starting to do better. They're getting her hydrated again and they're giving her antibiotics for the kidney infection. And so she is improving. Um, she's still in the, in the hospital. She may get to come home in a couple of days. So if you would continue praying for Wanda, and just uh, give the doctor and that God will give the doctor's wisdom and guidance as to how to best take care of her. And thank you for praying for her as you've done already. We'll continue to pray for her. I appreciate that. And as always, let's continue to pray for revival in the church of you know throughout our nation. Uh, not just Red Mountain Baptist Church, but but uh, um, all the Christian churches we see throughout the the nation, North America, even the world. Because uh, you know God has called us to be a light in this dark, dark world, and we need the church to rise up and to be that light. So we want to pray for revival. And then out of coming from revival, as we get out and do what we're supposed to do to shine the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're going to see lives change and see people's uh, lives change as they trust in, in Jesus Christ as we share the gospel. So we want to pray for a great spiritual awakening among lost people, a great harvest of souls. And so I just want to encourage you that each and every day, if you'll just take a few minutes each day to pray for that. And uh, of course, we do want to continue praying for our nation. There's a lot going on in our nation. There's unrest happening in our nation with different things happening, different situations. And there's so much going on. But, you know, I just want to encourage you. Uh, God reminded me yesterday at Colossians, at Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17, that He is uh, the creator of all things. He's made all things. Um, he existed before all things. God is eternal. Jesus is eternal. And uh, at the end of verse 17, it says that He holds all things together. So God is still in control. No matter what happens in this world, no matter what we face in this world, no matter what comes at us, Jesus is still in control. God is still on the throne. And Jesus is holding all things together. So it's not falling off the rails and just falling apart. God has a plan, and He's bringing this plan to completion. And so we just going to continue to trust Him and because He knows what He's doing and He knows what's best. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You that You are sovereign, that You are in control, that You are still on the throne. And you have not given up your throne. No one has taken the throne from you. You, Jesus, are the one who holds all things together. And we thank you for creating us. We thank you for being our Savior. We trust you as our Lord and Savior. And we just thank you that, that we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to worry about because you are sovereign. You are in control. And no matter what happens in this nation, no matter what happens in this world with the unrest, with politics, with COVID, or whatever else, it's taken, it hasn't taken you by surprise at all because you know what's coming. And you're bringing your plan about. You're bringing your plan to completion. You're getting things ready for the end times, I believe, Lord. And so, Lord, I just pray that we continue to trust you, look to you, and keep our focus on you. Keep our perspective right on you, Lord, as you uh, bring your plan about for our lives and for uh, your plan for the entire world, Lord. We just trust you. We thank you that you're in control. And, Father, we thank you uh, for being with Juan and all she's been through since she went to the hospital on Sunday morning. I'm thankful they figured out what was going on with her being dehydrated and having kidney infection in each kidney. And, and Lord, I just thank you that she's starting to feel better. And I pray that each and every day she continues to improve and get better. And that uh, you heal her of those kidney infections. You rehydrate her body, Father. And you just let her come home at the right time, Father. And may you continue to give her your peace that surpasses all understanding that you're going to take care of her, Lord. And use us in the way we can just to love her and care for her in the days to come. And Father, once again, we pray for revival in your church. Not just Red Mountain Baptist Church, but all the Christian churches throughout this world, Lord God. Father, we know we haven't lived like we're supposed to. We ask your forgiveness. We haven't been the light in this dark world like we're supposed to. We ask your forgiveness. But Father, my desire is for us to, to be that light, to rise up and to shine the light of Jesus Christ. So I pray you bring that about. Lord, let us have personal revival in our lives and then revival in your church, Lord God, that we will rise up and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and we will see a great harvest of souls, Lord. We will see a spiritual awakening take place in this nation and throughout the world, Lord God. 
And so many millions more people will know Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. We just pray you bring that about all for your glory. And Father, I pray today as we continue in our study in Hosea that you just would speak to our hearts from your living, powerful word about this very powerful, encouraging topic we're talking about today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, we're in Hosea chapter 2. So if you haven't turned there, go ahead and turn there. Hosea chapter 2 is where we're going to be uh, today. Now, if you remember, Hosea, he's heartbroken. He's a preacher. He's heartbroken. His wife, Gomer, has decided to, to leave him. She's left home, and she's gone back to her old way of life. You remember, she's called a wife of harlotry, so she's gone back to the way of prostitution. Now, Gomer, I mean, uh, uh, Hosea doesn't know what to do. He loves her, and yet she's left him. And he, you know, he hears reports maybe about what's going on, where she is, and, and then, you know, maybe that she hit rock bottom. And then he doesn't know where she is. She doesn't hear, hear things about where she is. He really doesn't know where to find her. But think about also, he's got those kids as well to take care of. He doesn't just have a wife that's left him, but their mother has, has left as well. And so now he's a father and a mother to those children that aren't even his kids, if you remember the, what we've already talked about. Now just get this picture in mind of maybe the, the day in the life of Hosea, what's going on. Every morning he gets up early. He gets the kids up, fixes them breakfast, gets them ready for school. He loads them up in the minivan. He takes them to school and drops them off. He goes throughout his day, does his responsibilities. He comes back when school's out. He picks them up. He takes them home. He helps them with their homework, feeds them dinner, gets them bathed, puts them to bed, and he's totally exhausted. And Hosea, this preacher, he goes to bed himself, and maybe he just cries himself to sleep because he's so heartbroken about his wayward wife. You know, in, in this very powerful story, this true story would actually happen. In a very unique and special way, God uses the marriage of Hosea and Gomer, this tragedy of a marriage, uh, to teach us very important lessons in our lives about sin and about love as well. In Gomer, we see the, peop the picture of, of people that are sinning. In Hosea, we see the picture of a loving God. You know, the tragic story of Gomer shows what sin does, this, the, the havoc it wreaks in our lives. And the magnificent story of Hosea shows what love does. And so today, what I want you to do is I want you to see a picture of God's love. That's what really we're going to see in the passage that we're looking at today is a picture of God's love. So let's look and see what it says there. We're in Hosea chapter 2. We're going to pick up in verse 14 where we left off last time. It says, Therefore, behold, I will lure her, will bring her into the wilderness, and speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there, and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband, and no longer call me my master. There, <clears throat> excuse me, for I will take from her mouth the names of Baals, and they shall be remembered there, and, and they shall remember their name no more. In that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, with the creeping things of the, of the ground. Bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth. I will make them lie down safely. I will be betrothed you to me forever. Yes, I will be betrothed you to me in righteousness and in justice and loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. It shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine, and with oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who are not of my people, You are my people, and they shall say, You are my God. Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. So I bought her for myself for fifteen shekels of silver and one and one half homers of barley. And I said to her, You shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be toward you, for the children of Israel shall abide many days without taking, excuse me, will abide many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and His goodness in latter days. You say, what in the world is he talking about? Well, we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about what he's talking about. He's talking about the love of God. Now, he's talking about love. What does love do? Well, we're going to find out what love does as we get a picture of God's love for us. And so there's three things I want you to see about love and what love does and, and, and three truths about love. The first thing I want you to notice is that love responds. True love responds. Love always responds. Now, the word love is a noun. 
But love can also be a verb. I mean, the Bible says, for God so loved the world, doesn't it? That love is an action word. It's a verb. And love always has to respond. True love does. Now, in the second chapter, we find a series of the words, therefore. It says it several times. You look at verse 6. It says, therefore, behold, I will hedge, hedge up your way with thorns and wall her end. So the picture is Gomer is hedged in, hemmed in by Hosea. He's not letting her get away just yet. In verse 9, it says, Therefore, I will return and take away my grain. There, there we see the necessities of life have been taken away from Gomer and, the, and trying to bring her to the end of herself, to realize that she's hit rock bottom, to, to see the depths of her sin, to the lowest point that she might turn to the one who desperately and longingly loves her. Turn back to him. But now we get to verse 14, where we're picking up today, and that's the third, therefore. So Gomer has hit bottom. And you would expect the hammer to fall. You expect judgment to come. But we don't find that at all, do we? Instead, look what Hosea says in verse 14. I will lure, lure her, but will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. He's saying, I'm just going to start all over again. I'm going to woo her again. I'm going to, to date her again, if you want to think about it that way. Now, this is a picture of the wonderful love of God. You see, God does not leave us where we are. God's love is not content to let us stay in our sin. God's love is a love that reaches out. God's love is a, is a love that, which he desires to restore us. So God says to Hosea, Hosea, I want you to seek her out again. Love her again. Now, can you imagine what Hosea must have been feeling, what he must have been thinking, that those contrary emotions, those conflicting feelings that, that must have gone through his heart? He loves her desperately, and yet she has sinned tremendously against him. His love for her and his hate for the sin find themselves at war in his own soul. But the Lord says, Hosea, I want you to love her again. And notice the, the series of I wills in this passage of Scripture. You see the action of love here, how it responds. Verse 15 says, I will give her her vineyards from there in the valley of Achor. Verse 17 says, I will take her from her, I will take from her mouth the names of Baals. Verse 19, I will betroth you. Verse 20, I will betroth you. Verse 21, it shall come to pass that day that I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens. Verse 23, I will sow her for myself. I will have mercy in her. I will say to those who, who are not my people, you are my people. You see the idea, idea there that love always responds. There's action behind love. It's not just lip service. There's action going on here. And look at verse 15. He says, I will give her her vineyards from there the, and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. Now, some of them once paraphrase this, this verse this way. I will turn Heartbreak Valley into Acres of Hope. That's a good way to think about it. You say, what world is the valley of anger? What's he talking about? Well, many times in the Bible, when something's mentioned for the first time, it's very instructive to us and, and really tells us what that term means. And that's the true of the valley of Achor. It goes back to Joshua chapter 7. And Joshua chapter 7 is one of the most familiar accounts in the Old Testament. It's the account of the children of Israel as they're getting ready to go to battle. They're going to battle against the city, the city of Ai. Now, they had just won the battle of Jericho. You remember Jericho? They marched around the walls. The walls fell down. They did it all God's way. Tremendous victory. And so they thought, you know, this next one's going to be a piece of cake. Ai is going to be a piece of cake. And when they go to battle at Ai, they are humiliated. And they are defeated. It's embarrassing how bad they're defeated. So Joshua goes before God in prayer, and the Lord says to him, it says, Joshua, there's sin in the camp. And we know what that sin was, because the Bible tells us. There was a man named Achan, and his name, his name meant trouble. See, the Bible tells us in the seventh chapter of Joshua that Achan, what, what he did was he, would st he stole some of the Babylonians' um, garments. He stole some of the shekels of silver, a wedge of gold, and he hid them in their tent. And he wasn't supposed to do that. God made it clear not to do that. Of course, as always is the case, sin can never ultimately be hidden. He tried to hide it, but it couldn't be hidden. And later that sin came out, didn't it? Just like the Bible tells us, be sure your sins will find you out. You can't hide your sin, and it eventually it's going to be, come out. God always knows you can't hide it from Him. Now, do you think you're getting away with your sin? No. You're not getting away with it. It's just a matter of time before it's revealed. And so Achan, whose name means trouble, is brought before Joshua. Listen to what it says in Joshua 7, 25 and 26. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire. What just him? It was his family. Burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then he raised, then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of the place has been called the, called the Valley of Achor to this day. Now remember, Achan's name meant trouble. Achor means troubling. So really, they're talking about a, the valley of troubling. 
That says to us that sin always causes trouble. Sin will always bring trouble into our lives. Sin never brings anything good into our lives. It always brings trouble into our life. When you decide that you're going to violate the Word of God, when you decide you're going to violate the ways of God, the will of God, and you live in rebellion against God, I'm telling you, you're bringing trouble into your life. How do I know? Because I've done it. I know what sin does. Oh, it's, it's beautiful on the front side of sin, but on the back side of sin, you realize the trouble it brings into your life. Sin always has a troubling effect. And it starts off so easy. The road seems so easy. It's wide and it's broad. The road of sin, you know, even though it's, it starts out easy and broad, it gets more and more narrow because eventually that sin crushes in on you. Just like that road comes to an end, that sin will crush it in on you. Sin always causes trouble in your life. Like, like you've heard people say many times, sin will take you farther than you ever want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you ever want to pay. But notice what God says. God says, Hosea, I'm going to let you woo her back. And I'm going to turn the valley of troubling into the door of hope, is what he's saying. Now, there is no hope in sin. I mean, there's just nothing but trouble in sin. But the Bible says in Ephesians 2.12 that without Jesus Christ, we're without God, we're without hope in this world. But in John 12.27, the night before Jesus went to the cross, Jesus Christ said this. He says, now my soul is troubled. You see, because Jesus entered the trouble of sin on himself, he brought that on himself, we now have a door of hope through Jesus Christ. It's open fully if we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. You see, this is how love responds. This is God's love for us, responding to the sin in our life. You see, it's a love that will not let go. I don't care how far you've gone, God can reach out to you. I don't care how deep you are in sin, God still loves you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your upbringing. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter if you've been like Gomer in your life. God still loves you tremendously. And God's love is reaching out to you. So Gomer has hit rock bottom. And Hosea responds with love. That's what love does. Love responds. Now here's the second truth that emerges from this passage. Not only do we see that love responds, but second we see that love seeks. Love seeks. Here we have a beautiful picture of what God has done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ as he's redeemed us and brought us back to himself. We move on to chapter 3 here in the book of Hosea. In verse 1, the Lord says to Hosea, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery. Let me give you a paraphrase of that. Start all over. Love your wife again, Hosea. Your cheating wife who's in bed with her lover. Start all over. The Lord is saying, Hosea, I want you to seek her out. And we learn something about the love of the Lord here. We learn that just like Gomer is sought by Hosea, you and I are sought by God. God seeks us out. God is using the tragedy of this marriage of Hosea to teach us about his love. The love of the Lord seeks us out. We're sought out by God. It says that, that this is the kind of love that, that God has for his, for his children. And we think about it, the Israelites as they were looking to other gods. They, were, they, were, they would love those cakes of, of raisins. You say, what in the world is that talking about? Those are references to idolatry, and it was characterized by the children of Israel at that time of their idolatry. And they left God, they're committing spiritual adultery, they're spiritually unfaithful. And notice what it says in verse 1, that they looked to other gods and they loved those cakes of raisins. That was part of the, the pagan worship of those false gods. Now, one of the reasons they went after other gods was because of what they thought they could get out of it. I mean, the reason Gomer went after her lovers was because of what she thought she could get out of it. Look back at chapter 2, and in verse 5 it says, She says this, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen and my oil and my drink. She thought she was going to get something out of it by going and doing that sin. I mean, that's what we sin, isn't it? It's because we think we're going to get something out of it. It could be pleasure. It could be all sorts of things. We think we're going to get out of it. But we do it because we think we're going to get something out of it. But what sin has to offer you is those cakes of raisins. You say, what are they talking about? Things that don't matter. It's amazing the little things that we reach for as we turn away from God that really don't matter, that really are pointless. I mean, the material things. The thing about people, you know, they, they reach for amusements of life. They turn their back on God. They sell out the Lord for the little trinkets of life. They sell out the Lord for the temporary pleasures of this life. You find out when you sell out for the things of this world that there's this increasing craving for a diminishing pleasure. In other words, those things never satisfy. That's the way sin is. You have this increasing craving for a pleasure that's diminishing because you want more and you want more and you want more because you're never satisfied. You see, the only satisfaction we have is in Jesus Christ. The only fulfillment we have is in Jesus Christ. So Hosea starts looking for Gomer. 
I can almost imagine him looking for Gomer. He, he goes around to the hotels, maybe where she used to sell herself to men. He goes down to those motels and other places and he says, Have you seen Gomer? Do you know who Gomer is? Here's a picture of Gomer. Have you seen her? And he's seeking after her. Just like God's seeking after you today. Jesus is seeking after you today. But the good news is, he knows exactly where you are. And he's seeking after you to work in your heart to bring you to himself is what he wants to do. And so Hosea makes his way to the marketplace. He's moving up and down the roads and the streets. He's getting closer and closer to that place that, that's known as a slave market. Hosea is making his way there now, and he's looking for Gomer, and he's certainly saying, well, surely she's not at the slave market. But he gets closer and closer to the slave market, and he begins to hear all that bidding going on, and he hears the crowd cheering, and he hears the, the slaves cussing and fighting back. And then he looks up on the, on the auction block, and he sees this naked woman. Now, in those days, when they saw the slaves, they stripped them down naked. They robbed them of every bit of human dignity they had. They were just a, just a, a piece of a property, if you want to think about it that way, which is totally wrong. And he looks up there and he sees this woman. She has no clothing on. She's aged. She's worn. You can tell she's been abused. You can see the scars and the stain of sin on her life. And before he realizes it, he's, he, he, all of a sudden he sees who's it, who it is. It's Gomer. And he runs over to the man doing the auction. He says, listen, that's my wife Gomer. That man says, get out of here. I don't care if she was one time your wife. She now belongs to this guy. He's selling her to the highest bidder. You see, that's exactly what sin will do for us. Sin will turn you into damaged goods. Sin will put you on the bargain shelf of life. Sin will sell you to the lowest bidder. Damaged, soiled, rent reduced in value. Look at verse 2. It says, So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver. You say, what's the big deal about that? Well, back then, a slave was sold for 30 shekels of silver. Remember Jesus? Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. But not Gomer. This woman was reduced to half price. They couldn't get many people to bid on her, so they're going to sell her for half price. I mean, get the picture. One guy says, I'll give her, I'll give five shekels. Another guy says, I'll give six. Another guy says, ten. And up walks Hosea, and Hosea says, I'll pay full price. I'll pay the 15 shekels of silver today and a meal ticket of barley, because that's what was a food for slave at that time. Going once, going twice, sold to Hosea. Now remember, God's using this tragedy in the life of Hosea to teach us a lesson about how he loves us. Where in all the universe do you get the clearest picture of God's love? I think that most, most of us know the answer to that question. If you want to see God's, God's greatest example of love in all the universe, you have to go to the cross. You have to go to Calvary. Spiritually speaking, the cross is where the Lord Jesus Christ went on the slave market of sin. And it was at the cross that the Lord Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins. Listen to 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers. Listen to this. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. When Jesus died on the cross and when his precious blood was poured out on Calvary, he was paying the price to redeem you and me to bring us back to God to save us from the slime pits of hell, that torment of hell, to, to pull us off the slave market of sin and bring us back to God because he's seeking after us to bring us back to God. That's what love does. Love responds. Love seeks. But here's the third thing I want you to see. Love restores as well. Look at verse uh, 3 of chapter 3. It says, And I said to her, You shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be toward you. Hosea is saying, Gomer, you're mine now. Twice your mind. He said, first time I married you. And, and, and yeah, I took you to myself in holy, holy matrimony. But now, Gomer, you're twice mine because I've also bought you. You belong to me now. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, it says, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We belong to God because Jesus has paid the price for us. Gomer can't believe it. Can you imagine? She's probably overwhelmed. She says, Hosea, you mean to tell me after, after the way I treated you, you're willing to take me back? He says, darling, I'm willing to take you back. But Hosea, look at me. I, I'm not a beautiful woman anymore. I, I'm worn down. I'm, I'm a, I've been abused. I'm just, uh, sin's wreaked havoc in my life. He says, oh, honey, you're as beautiful as you've ever been. I've got news for you. 
When the love of God redeems you through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the precious blood of Jesus Christ is applied to our lives and covers our sin. So when God sees you and me, he doesn't see the sin in our life anymore. Instead, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and we're beautiful to God. So what does Hosea do? He says, come on home, Gomer. Look at verse 3. You shall stay with me many days. Every day Hosea probably tells her how much he loves her, how special she is to him, how precious she is to him. And she may question, do you really mean it? After all I've done, he says, I love you and I will not let you go. I don't know about you, but there's times in my own relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and I see the sin in my life that I commit. I see how unworthy I am, how sinful I am. And I might question, Lord, Lord, how could you love someone like me? And the Lord says, you know what? I want you to know I love you with a love that I will not, that will not let you go. That's how God loves us. That's how God restores us to himself, through the love that he has for us, what Jesus Christ has done for us. Look at verse 4. He applies this now to the children of Israel. He says, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king. That's, that's happened right now to Israel, isn't it? And he goes on to say, Or a prince without sacrifice, or sacred pillar, or without ephod, or teraphim. In other words, they have no priesthood over there now. That's the state of Israel right now. And, and look what God promises in verse 5. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God. This is the promise of the spiritual return of the children of Israel to God. It says, and David their king, and they shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. God is saying to Israel, Israel, you have a future. And you know what God is saying to you? You have a future. There's a tomorrow for you. You say, wait a minute, preacher. You don't know what I've done. I have blown it too many times in the past. I don't know what your past is, is entailed. But I've got good news for you. God will forgive you of your past. And God still has a future for you. He has a purpose and a plan for your life. You can begin today and respond to the love of God. You can become the person that God created you to be. Because you have a glorious future. Why not turn to God today for that glorious future? Trust Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. And if you've done that, but you're living in sin, why not confess it and repent of that sin and get right back with God where you need to be so you can live in that future, that purpose He has for you. Heard a story about a wayward boy who left his family one time. It broke their hearts. He just wanted to go out and live for himself and didn't care about his family anymore. He wandered far out into this world of sin and lived it up in a sinful lifestyle. And for years, his family didn't hear from him. And then finally, he hit rock bottom, kind of like Gomer. And one day, he wrote his family a letter. He says, Dear family, I've gone a long way off from you. I've been gone a long time and done a lot of things I shouldn't have done. I know I've broken your heart. And I don't know if you want to see me again, but I, I want to see you again. I'd like to come home. And so I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to board a train, and I want to come home. And I'm not sure if you want to see me, and I can't blame me if you don't. But, Dad, do you remember that apple orchard alongside the railroad tracks on that farm just before you get to the train station near our house? If you'll let me come home, would you just take a, a white handkerchief and, and hang it from one of the branches in, in one of those trees? And when I see you on the train, I'll know you want me to come home, and I'll get off the train. But if you don't want me to come home, just don't hang that handkerchief. And I won't get off the train. I'll just keep on riding the train to the end. Well, that boy boarded the train. And he really didn't expect to see a handkerchief. He didn't expect to stop and get off to see his family. But as they got closer and closer to that, that farm where those, those trees were, that, that train station was, his apprehension increased. And his sense of unworthiness, his sense of, of sinfulness overwhelmed him. And he began to, to feel so sorrowful that he just hung his head in defeat and discouragement. Well, the passenger nearby on the train noticed something was going on and he was troubled. So he went over and sat next to him. He said, son, it's obviously something's going on with you. Is there any way I can help? And that young man told the passenger sitting next to him the, what, the whole story about the letter and everything like that, how he left his family, he was headed back home. And he said, he said, we're getting close to that farm. And I've asked them if they're willing to, to let me come home to hang a handkerchief, a white handkerchief from one of those branches in one of those trees. But I couldn't imagine they love me enough to let me come home. I just can't look. So the pastor said, well, son, you just keep your head down, and I'll look for you, and I'll tell you what I see. They got closer and closer, and then they got to the farm, and the pastor said, son, look up. And when the boy looked up, there was a handkerchief, a white handkerchief on every branch of every tree of that farm in the orchard. Friend, God has put his handkerchief in every branch of every tree. He says, I love you. Would you come on home? This is the picture of God's love for us. Why do we run from it? Stop running from God's love. And trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior today. If you haven't done that, I want to encourage you to do so. Maybe you've already done that, but you're running from God because you're living in sin. You're miserable. Oh, sin was attractive in the front end of it, but now that you're in it, you're miserable. It's crushing your life. It's bringing trouble to your life. Remember the Valley of Achor? 
Nothing but trouble. Why not open that door of hope and come back to God today through repentance and confession and get right with God? Maybe you're closer to God than you've ever been, but there's a lot of people that need to experience what you're experiencing, the love of God. Let's get out there and tell them about the love of God. Isn't God's love tremendous? It's just a beautiful picture that He has for us, this love. Father, I thank You for Your love for us. I thank You for how You care for us. And it's so hard for us to just comprehend your great love for us. But you've given us a beautiful picture here in the passage of Scripture we looked at today. So I pray we'll remember that and apply it to our lives. For those who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, I pray today they will turn from their sins and ask Jesus to forgive them and place their trust and faith in Him to be the Savior and Lord of their life. For those who have already done it, Father, but they're miserable because they're living in sin, I pray you convict them, Holy Spirit. And I pray that you just make it miserable in their life. Well, they can't help but turn back to you. And, and out of your love, you're going to take them back and you're going to forgive them when they repent, Father. And Father, may all of us Christians go out and share this love with this world that so desperately needs to hear it and see it lived out and know that God loves them. Lord, use us this week to share the love that you have for each and every person on the face of this earth. And I just thank you once again for your great love for us. May we never get over that. May we never forget it. But may we just be appreciative of it and live in that love each and every day. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for tuning in and watching today. And I just pray that each and every day you're reminded of God's love for you.